everybody. I'm Carson Grubaugh. Hi, I'm Brandon Graham. And today we're going to look at, I think, Brandon, because uh, my folder for this, a number of the examples are from your books. I think this is a formalism that you probably really like. You keep coming back to it is put, inserting games into comics. Oh, sure. Is that that's is that fair to say it's something you enjoy in comics and in, intentionally do? Yeah, I mean, part of it for me is that it um, it feels like a very untapped thing. It's like it's like if you look at comic books as uh, as as everything you can do with words and pictures, and then like obviously that includes you know games and puzzles. And yeah. I like the idea of having a comic book and actually convincing the reader to to like write in the comic in some way. Like I remember in, I don't know if you have an example of it in this one, but in King City, I have a, there's an aura of a statue that used to be there that you can see. And I did a um, connect the dots with it. Yeah, I actually had that on screen, but I realized I put the screen share and it showed our drawing. Oh. <laughs> so that was, the, I was I, I was looking at that while you were talking about it. This is what you're talking about, right? Okay, yeah. And I, I try, I don't know if it was that effective, but I tried to make it where you couldn't see what the image looked like with, until you connected the dots. Well, you'll be happy to know that oh, I, did, I did draw in my Brandon Graham comic book <laughs> <laughs> and That's I the found book. the statue in there. Is that the right drawing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I enjoyed that. I, and it's, I agree. There's um, because I spent so long in like the the fine art world, you know, museum gallery bound stuff rather than comics. There's that whole like don't touch it aspect, like don't get close to the art, don't touch it, and that always frustrated me. So I tried to find ways to gamify the museum experience as well. Um, nice. So I really enjoy that in in your work. Like you can see, I have a number of examples of of your stuff in here um, where people are including games and, oh, and I, for the crossword puzzle. yeah, I also like another category that I'm interested in and we'll talk about a different time is documents in comics. So mm -hmm. in this one, the game is a document in the book, right? And then is that, is this the same one? And then you set yeah. up, like you can actually go play the crossword puzzle that the character was reading. Yeah, that's a weird thing in this one where I, I include Sexica from my Multi Warhead series as just on the crossword puzzle page, even though they're not even in the same universe. But they are now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I didn't go do this one. Is this all answerable? It's all answerable and it's all things that you can find within the comic. But I also I realized after I made that that they were just computer programs that you could use to that will do all the work for you yourself when over on the computer when I just went in and did everything I had to figure out myself and didn't know what it was and part of it for me is just like it's a it's an excuse to be like what would it be like to make a crossword puzzle and it's it's hard <laughs> it, well and do you know the actual because I I made a crossword puzzle at some point for one of those fine art projects that I, I was talking about do you know the, like how strict the rules on crossword puzzles are no I wonder if I broke them when I made that you totally broke them they have to be um, symmetrical top to bottom and flipped. So if you look wow. at an actual crossword puzzle, uh, let's let's see if we can find one. Um, the that's part of the if you get into crossword puzzling, you'll so notice how it's uh, it's like this mirrored symmetry, dark magic from side to side. So pretty much every professional crossword puzzle you look at is going to have that symmetrical structure in it. So uh, the, really the people who make them, part of what makes people follow a specific crossword puzzle maker is the tricks that they'll play with that symmetry. Uh, I had no idea. It reminds me, there's a Matt Howarth, Connie and Zoo book that I liked a lot. That's um, it's these two aliens that one of them's a centipede and the other one's three floating rocks. And he did this, this uh, comic book about them and he had so he used the same panel layout on every page, but when he has to do something slightly different, he just turned the page upside down. And it's ah. like a really fun way to not have to think about your panel layouts. You know, like you yeah, restrict just, yourself. Just steal from yourself from, from a mm -hmm. previous. Yeah. So there there are when you're talking about formalisms, there's these 
for a real crossword puzzle, there's a. I like how that real... looks like stairs on the one your mouse was on. This one. Or the one yeah. To the... yeah, that one. Like you yeah. could do that as a comic page of someone doing a crossword puzzle and have them walking down the stairs. Yeah, that would be cool. I hadn't even thought about that because it is a panel structure setup as well. But there's a lot of like real formal constraints that a real crossword puzzle maker is bound to. And then they'll they'll embed meaning into that as well. Um, It'd be interesting to have a, a comic page that's just set up like, you know, you have a grid page and then you have the questions on the side of the page and then you have little numbers in the corner of the panels and then they, the dialogue and the characters actions are actually answering the questions. Oh shit, Brandon. That can get now complicated. You gotta, but... Now you got to go make that. <laughs> we're going to get too many ideas right now. Um, so yeah, th this, like as hard as it was to make this, imagine that you had to bind yourself to the preset amount of letters and then you had to figure out how to fit everything in there. Yeah, it's nuts. Uh, yeah, it's mind boggling. And then you have like board games. Yeah, that one I've never actually even played myself, but it's it's playable. That okay, we'll have to try and play that. I tried to make a board game comic. Let me see if I can find it. Um, oh god, I'm not no, it's not gonna be on my computer. I tried to make a board game comic as well at one point in time, I never finished it. But each one was a panel that you can read, and it was also a multi directional story. So, like, oh, nice. like the, the character could like graduate college, or it was kind of like the game of life, right? Like character could graduate college or he could just go work at McDonald's and like th those stories would have to intersect in different ways as it went around. I had it all planned. I never finished it. I should have, I should have finished it. Um, oh yeah. This is uh, from James Stokoe's uh, wonton soup where he has, it's the characters are taking a drug that is um, the science fiction future drug that actually has a built in, a safety device where like a moose or something shows up and it's like hey you guys have taken too many drugs here's here's the antidote um and they smoke the antidote and it gets even crazier and and this one it says it, it gets so intense that the uh that stoko put himself in the comic and uh has uh <laughs> things that you cut out and inject in your bloodstream to draw the rest of the of the scene so it's up to you to finish it yeah, once you've injected, or, the, cut out those things and inject it into your bloodstream. Or if you're too busy and you just suck, then just imagine it as a snowstorm. Because <laughs> uh, there's that famous, um, was it John Byrne Alpha Flight issue that's a snowstorm? Are you familiar with that? No, did he do an all white issue? It's not the entire issue, but I think it's it's at least the first couple pages. And it, and I mean, it still has really beautiful lettering on it and sound effects and everything, but it is it is just in a snowstorm and the character being like, I'm going to transform into an eagle now. Like, <laughs> look at that. Oh, no, uh, a three point perspective uh, skyscraper. I better avoid that. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's the ultimate lazy in a good way. Dave did that with the black, like Sarah was trying to walk up the stairs in the dark and the, the panel borders tell tell the story. Oh, yeah. um, that's cool. What was this from? I don't always remember all of these, but it, like this one had a cipher built into it and the character has to learn these symbols. This is a kid's book I picked up from Second and Charles. Uh, it might be a Matt Kent book. This would be something Matt Kent would do. He's really into the puzzles, but you could actually like solve your way across and the, the character has cool. to like push, push the buttons and solve solve these puzzles within the comic um obviously you don't dog. yeah <laughs> and some other like here's a moebius one um yeah that's also a game i think i put that in there because or i sent that to you because it's um it's the character who has a boner that won't go away and he has to sneak into a city where boners are illegal and uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so he, he he has this idea because of all this stuff around him that he can become a flower seller to block it. But it has, on the right side of the middle panel, it has the thing that says spot and ham sandwich that has nothing to do with it. And I just really enjoyed how nonsensical it was. But but it also has like a a game built into it. Oh, Not yeah, like actually point. playable, but it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like this one 
where the character is provided with all of these options and then you like you could come up with different ways that he could use those to block his boner i think like what could you do with each of these objects like that'd be great to have that you yeah to show like um different things he could do that don't work with all those things. Um, or you could even do a simpler thing where you just see the flowers growing and he has the idea and then you see him with the box of flowers. I feel like that would be more like a, a Bugs Bunny version of it. But it's I like, like where this, do you get the boards? Yeah. I like the mental game in this where like, okay, he could take the string and tie his boner down or, or like tie, like, you know, do the lift and tuck and just tie it to his chest. Sure. <laughs> Or like he could use the boards in the same way. So I think there's a solution. I don't know what the spot is, but yeah, I think there's a solution with each one of these, maybe in Moebius's mind. And so you're invited to, um, you're invited to come up with different strategies. And this is just the one that the character took. Yeah, and the string is hanging off. There's like a hook on a rock. Also, there's nothing to show how he writes little yellow flowers on the box. Oh, like what? Yeah. Or where he got the box from. Oh, no, he he makes the box out of the boards. Oh, OK. And then he uses the string to tie it. So he hammered it together with the hammer and nails. Yeah. So that's um, how he made it all. OK. Yeah, I, I like see. how I like how much fun Moby was having. Stuff. And this is the one uh, It's called the horny goof. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and when Marvel was translating them, this is one that they did not translate. So I think Dark Horse did it in the same format. Uh, is like Mobius Zero. There's actually a Mobius One Half book too, which I don't have, which is just a lot of his black and white short stories. Yeah, I wish someone needs to do. I know Dark Horse started doing the Mobius Library. Yeah. Uh, oh, this one's fun. This is a Marla Manara one from one of his Bergman books. And it's this uh, little girl who's telling a story of, of a villain in a story. And she kind of talks about the shape of the villain and then comes up with all the, she has all these options for what its face could look like. And then you see, kind of like you're talking about with the with the box and the string and the Mobius thing, you, you get different versions of the faces she could make when she's coming up with an evil face. Yeah, and if you're willing to cut up your comic, you have like a paper doll. Yeah, that'd be fun if there was a blank panel like in the Stoko one where they're just like, uh, make your own villain. Yeah, or draw draw any of your own or rearrange any of these, cut them out. That would be fun. And that's a, a Matt Howarth. Um, it's like an entry exam to get into a comic book, which I think is a really fun idea. And it has the a rebus structure in it too, potentially, um, where it's like, like this plus this plus this equals that. Like the a, a rebus is something I've used multiple times in my work where. It's like I see you, and then you'd have like an icon of an eye, and then an ocean, and then like a female sheep. Okay, I'm not uh, familiar with that term. You're not familiar with the rebus? No. It's uh, let me pull up an example. Again, from the uh, I this is in the the comic that I did for myself for fun that me and Sean are gonna publish amongst other stuff. So this would be a rebus, like I actually. Uh, I don't I don't even remember what <laughs> what I put in here, but each one of these it, this is how language worked before we got phonetic language. If you had like someone's name and uh, like Carson, my my name's perfect for it. They didn't have phonetic language, so they would have drawn a car and drawn a son, like you know a, a thing that they actual objects nouns that you had pictures for. They'd put them together. Or the sounds of them that's the idea of a rebus I like that fit with the f and cousin it yeah fit to and then i got extra crazy with it and it's also morse code so whether <laughs> it's a dash or a dot so uh -huh. there's like there's two or three messages hidden in here like wow. one is if you solve the rebus one is if you solve the morse code um and then also every page in the book has WTF written in it. So the W, the T, and the F are also parts of the rebus, but has the WTF. So it's like comics on hard mode. Is it something where you'd include where you'd include the answers later in the book? No. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, no. The, the, the whole book 
uh, has a lot of puzzles hidden hidden in it. Um, so to me, that looks like the rebus structure. Maybe me. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I get that sense that that's a rebus. Because sometimes, sometimes for a rebus, you can say like, like if you want part of the word to go away, you could say this minus the next thing. Oh, like yeah. if you want, if you want, if you need the letter C A, but you can't come up with something for it, but you could come up with something that made someone say can't and then minus an ant. Right. right. You could do an apple minus a pole and have it say app or something. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's um, cool. So I think that's a really unexplored part of comics. The way I got to it is. Scott McCloud talking about non sequitur panels. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to come up with a way that you could make a non sequitur panel. You know, like that thing I just showed looks pretty non sequitur, but there is a logic behind it. Um, that's how I got to using Rebus, Rebus and comics. Uh, this one, I think this is a Hope Larson book. Um, I think this is her book, Chiggers. This is really fun that they put in the uh, Mad Libs. Oh yeah, that is cool. Into the word balloon. So like you could you could talk to your friend and like the comic could get filled out with a mad lib. Nice. Um, and then a Guido Creepa board game. Oh, I've never seen this one. That's cool. Yeah, and one of the Valentina books. Uh, so those those are the examples that between uh -huh. the two of us we've collected so far. I like that. Creepa is a guy who does not seem to have a standard. Um, like a lot of artists have like this, their standard page uh, layout they'll go back to. Um, you know, like I have a Paul Pope book here and I bet I can find a Paul Pope page pretty easily, like where he does larger panels. And then I'll have these kind of skinny ones that are smaller in the middle and it kind of, he, he like makes space by making these ones smaller, I think. But yeah. Fairfax just, it's just a new layout every time. And it, that stuff's really um, impressive to me. Because I, because I certainly have my go-to panel layouts. Yeah, I mean that's why I buy the Crepa books is like, Crepax, whatever. I don't know how to pronounce it, but that that's that's the main reason I buy them, is just flipping through them and looking. I mean, me and Sean did that video about it, but looking at his his page layouts is just a pure inspiration. And I think Sean cracked some of the Crepax code when when we did our analysis of him. Um, at least not on every page, but I think there actually is a code underneath a lot of what he does that when we were analyzing him, Sean cracked it a little bit where he'll get like the key images in a sequence and then, and then everything else is just rhythmic subdivisions of, of the rest of the page. And then you kind of just scatter in like random shots of whatever else is going or on around those key moments. And that's how he kind okay. of creates that rhythmic structure. So and an establishing he, shot first, and then he'll within once he once he once he's convinced the reader of like, this is where you're at, then he can just play around with it. Well, I think let me see if I can pull up a page that on the internet that that's really one of those really because he'll do those super dense, dense pages with like a ton of panels on them. Right. And, and they, they kind of have that Chris Ware thing where they spill out and it's not every page, but this is a good example. Oh, maybe not. Um, I don't think the, this is the best example, but it's pretty good. And his first name is Guido, which is one of those things that you just don't hear of kids being named anymore. <laughs> it's an awesome first name. That's good. Uh, but this one here, like, I think there is... That fur coat is great. Yeah. So Sean's speculation was, is, and I don't, again, I don't think this page is the best example of it, but you would get, like, the key moments, not an establishing shot, but you'd have, like, this, this, and this are, like, the important things. And then these just get filled in kind of late later like i don't know you would pick your like four establishing shots and then from there it's just breaking it up in mathematical subdivisions of some sort whether they be intuitive or mathematical but it's like this is half of that this is broken into like two chunks right this this right. these two is half of that these two is half of that 
then you cut that into half, but then you cut this into fours and then this becomes two of the four and that breaks into four. And then you just start filling them in with like, oh, we've got shoes and lips and an eye and sure. that allows the rhythmic stuff. What's going on in the, in, can you go back to that page real quick? There's a lot yeah. of weird and cool stuff going on there. <clears throat> What's going on in the, uh, in the middle, the middle chunk of panels with the, the second to the last one, I guess it's the, the fifth panel. It's hard to, I'm having a hard time zooming in on this page because it's taking me to a file, not the image. Oh, yeah. This one right here where she's like see-through. Yeah. Yeah. Is I'm it her thinking sure. of something? I think so. Yeah. I are we seeing it. what she sees next to her head? And she says, um, I took one of those stooges. Yeah. I, I gotta get this It says comments. tonight. Yes. Tonight. I took one of those stu stockings. I think she stockings. says stockings. That's yeah, and then a she's got a stocking in her hand. <laughs> oh, okay, that makes more sense. Um, and I really love the panel before that, where it's just her, where the panel borders the ground, and, and it's just that super skinny, her walking with the guys behind her. Yeah, and, and that's another one of, like, these are the dialogue ones, and then this can just be whatever. And yeah. so he just has a shape, and then it's like, well, what best fills that shape in an interesting way? Uh, but it's not necessary to the story really you know you could yeah. transition from here to here pretty easily it's also one of those like kind of like a frank miller in the sense where his if you just saw one of his illustrations i don't think you it would be like he's not very technically uh doesn't kind of wow you with his technical ability but in a in a comic it works so well yeah and i mean uh, to me like it's pretty obvious that frank miller spent a lot of time looking at him because like that's a that's a frank miller face if i've ever seen one yeah, that's Electra with a haircut. Yeah, but like way before and the, the big yeah. lips and the eyes. So I do think that it's almost, it's not crude because he can be really like Gustav Klimt, like some really sophisticated drawing sometimes, but other times it is really crude. Yeah. Uh, especially uh, it might just be, men. yeah, maybe his interest is left, but almost just like an economy of where he's spending his time. Like, like this is just a, I just want to convey simple information. So I'm going to just do a simple, simple drawing. Yeah. But then other times like that fur coat, he'll spend all day. Like, yeah, uh, he really knows how to balance that stuff. But I think I was so impressed when Sean pointed that out because it, it helped me understand what looks like Crepaw's completely every page is different. Like you're saying, it's like, Oh, yeah. there is, there is a code behind it. And I'm still, I'm going to steal that code. I'm stealing that strategy for something I'm working on too, because it's a really, it's a really fun way to, to create a page. I've been having a lot of fun creating just page layouts that way. Certainly. Yeah. I do like that stuff. And it's really fun to be like, this is a, this style layout where you try to emulate, like I've done pages sometimes where I'll just take uh, the blocking of a, of a page that I like and ignore the drawings and just copy the blocking and then put my own drawings in the, in the panels. Yeah, and when you study different artists, like one of the most fascinating things to me is the conjunction of their page layouts with their style. Mm -hmm. And 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 people do have like go-to blocking styles as well that I think a lot of people could overlook when they're analyzing someone's style. They just look at this, like Jim Lee, how do you make the the hatch marks but right yeah and it's interesting with a guy like jim lee because his technical drawing kind of wows people and then a lot of his other chops i feel like it sounds are more lacking like it like if you just if you took a jim lee comic and had it less well drawn it would a lot of it would just fall apart because of the storytelling's a little wacky yeah yeah, and he plays with, I mean, he th those image guys too had those weird page structures because they're always trying to create room for the big thing. Yeah. So the, they'll kind of scatter panels around and that that's like, it, you can't really do a Jim Lee page without kind of stealing that style a little bit. I mean, he has normal pages too, but. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm probably I'm probably selling him short because my idea of Jim, of Jim Lee is from 1993. But um, I remember him doing things like there was a Wildcats issue where where they had like a, a fold out of just a character kicking someone in the head or something. 
Oh yeah, like the four page fold out. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's just I, I, there's certainly um, I think when people talk about early image, there's this there's this enthusiasm about how much fun they were clearly having when they're doing things like let's just do this, and then all the different guys trying to outdo each other with how weird their ideas are, and they're they're working in such a completely different language than like the fan of graphics guys that are doing some other who can be sadder this week or whatever. <laughs> yeah, but like, come on. Oh uh, yeah. That's an amazing drawing. You can't hate on that. That's pretty fun. Do you know about the um, Atari Force connection to Wildcats? No. So Zealot and Grifter there, design-wise, look so much like Jose Luis Garcia Lopez's um, Atari Force main two characters, down to even the markings on Zealot's face, if I'm, if I'm remembering right. You might have to type in comic, or maybe there it goes. It covers right there. Um, yeah, so that second one, like oh. if you put a mask on that guy, he's he's grifter and that's sell it, you know, if you lighten her skin. Yeah, I can see that. Huh. I've never seen this comic before. This was a DC thing. Oh yeah, that does look like Zealot with the ponytail. Yeah. And I think I think Lee took it in a different direction. Uh, but oh, she's it's cool got to the see. dot. She's got the dot on her head. Yeah. And the swoops on the side. Yeah, and they, he changed the swoops to kind of almost just like cat whiskers almost. Yeah, interesting. But it, it is one of those things like, um, you know, like Frank Miller's Sin City. Uh, like, I don't think Frank Miller's really talked about Munaz and Sampaio's Sinner very much, but it seems like such an obvious uh, influence. Yeah, it, as a did... Weaver fan art of, of, of Dart. Um, yeah, this is cool. Which one are you saying is Grifter, the dude with the bandana? This guy? Yeah, it's a, he's just a blonde guy with a mullet and a headband. Yeah, okay. Maybe that's more of a that. stretch, but combine him with this guy in the the jacket. The zealot oh, yeah. looks pretty obvious. Um, yeah, I was really the Alak Center ones, and and then the the Creepak, the Creepa, however you say his name. When I started reading those books, I was like, oh, my God, like, how come no one's ever talked about this guy's influence on Frank Miller? Because there's the things that they you would typically talk about more. But I've never heard that mentioned. And it's like, dude, I mean, obviously, he draws his women. The faces are exactly the same. Um, yeah, so I haven't I think, made that connection before today either. And there's a lot of I've been thinking about Frank Miller a lot lately. With a lot of the stuff I'm looking at like really he went and stole from like every master mm -hmm. he stole from hugo pratt he stole from crepa he stole from moebius he stole from uh munoz and then like somehow synthesized all of those things together and right and, into a frank miller style and, but you tell me like oh i'm gonna take moebius and munoz and make a style out of the two of those you'd say well that's fucking crazy <laughs> like, yeah yeah it is but i mean i think the impressive thing is that it, it does become its own thing because um because i think what happens when people kind of fail on that is if you if you have you know if if, if someone draws something and it does and the two things they're trying to mesh in their styles don't become their own um i always feel like i, I often describe it as the difference between eating something and digesting it and and kind of passing it through you or just wearing it like a coat, you know, sometimes yeah. you'll like, like there's artists where I feel like they hide their lines, their real lines, like you'll see their, their pencils, and it's how they actually draw. And then you'll see their inks, and it's them like, you know, trying to ink like someone else as opposed to trying to ink like themselves. Yeah, that's interesting. But when, it's, it's especially hard when you're taking such diverse styles. Uh, there's, there's a guy I've been looking at lately. Uh, he's, from the Czech Republic, I think, or something. I don't know his name. He did a, he did a book, uh, Image First Dagger or something like that. That but sounds he, familiar. He looks like a combination of Sergio Topi and Mike Mignola. First Dagger. Oh, I know who you're talking about. He, he did it with Simon Roy. Yeah. It's amazing that I, I was like, oh, yeah, my friend Simon that I did a million books with. Yeah, uh, I know RTM it was someone. Is the that, guy's name. Yeah. And he's Russian. Okay, I thought he was from like a more obscure Eastern European country, but he might be. I don't know too much about the guy. But he's taken some styles that 
I would have never thought you could merge together and put them together. I'm always impressed when that when that happens. Huh. Like things that seem like like Magnolia is so simple and Topi is so dense, but he's found that they both are based in shape. Mm -hmm. and been able to use that to put them together. I was thinking the Mobius influence on Frank Miller is mostly seen in uh, in Ronin. I don't know. Does do you feel like it goes past that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, like I think it's issue two of Ronin is like, okay, I'm doing Mobius for an issue. Right. Um. Yeah, I think if you go look at if you go look at that issue of Ronin. And look at how he got down to the clean lines. And then look at how he starts piling the darks on top of the clean lines as the series goes. I do think you can see some of the carryover. Huh. But you could also just look at Hugo Pratt for that. Like the clean lines with the big wedgy chunks of black slapped over top of it. I was watching the new, I think it's the new Suicide Squad movie that came out. Yeah, and uh, they they mention uh, the island Cordel Maltese in it. You know, oh, kind of... I didn't catch that. That movie's fucking crazy, though. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is crazy, but um, yeah, because I think Frank Miller introduced that in uh, Dark Knight Returns. They talk about Cordel Maltese, and I always wondered what it was like for someone in Italy to just be reading a Batman comic, and then they're talking about like we're going. It would be like. You know, if we were trying to read something and they're just like, we're going to go check out Scooby-Doo. It's just like, <laughs> that's a weird <laughs> name to use for something. It sounds like a good island name, though. Cardo Maltese? Yeah, it does. Yeah. But yeah, I think I think maybe that's why it's easy to miss the... Or maybe he shed the Mobius. I don't know. But it seems like I see the progress of like simplifying the lines down the thin, clean lines, getting rid of all of the hatchy stuff get to that Moebius, okay, then get rid of all the ticky marks and then start slapping black on it. Yeah, there's a great Katsuro Tomo story, the Akira guy, when he first um, when he first encountered Moebius, he did a, a short story that's just about a, I think it's a guy fighting a squid monster in the desert over a rose. And it's so like, um, it's almost like he just had to get it out of his system because he's, he has some of that French European stuff in his, in his style, but it, um, it does get so kind of taken over by his own style. It's weird to see like the moment it kind of got into his system, how he, how he draws. I think it gets like, yeah, everyone has to, I don't know why it is that Moebius does that more than anyone else, but. Um, I, uh, I used to run into to Kaluta, uh, Michael Kaluta at comic conventions when I was in my mm -hmm. early twenties. And I remember once he said that, um, that Moebius is an artist who uh, teaches you to draw by looking at his art. Like he makes it seem easy. And I, I always like that quote. It's it's like an infectious disease though. Yeah, it's like his line is so pretty that you're like, oh, if I just draw a line like that in relation to these other lines, then it can look so nice no matter what I do. Like I I feel like there's an argument for, for making that, he, that Mobius is one of the most influential artists of the last hundred years because it's, I basically at some point I was like, everyone whose work I like loves Mobius. Well, I mean, he, he basically, in my mind, defined like the look of science fiction as we still know it. Yeah, yeah, there's been a lot of that. And um, it's interesting looking at where his styles came from because there's so much like Hergé in it and then so much like Jack Davis. Yeah, Jack Davis makes sense. I, you know, I just got the collected 1010, the whole like li they're little, they're small, like hardcover books. <laughs> and I'm having a hard time reading those, man. They're pretty to look at, but it's <laughs> like, I, dude, how have these persisted for so long? I, I, there's a animated version of Tintin that they kind of, uh, there was a kind of an American uh, dub of them that I watched, and I remember not enjoying it as much. And then I went back and read the books, and they'd taken away all the opium and all the the weirdness of Tintin. And I, and I feel like maybe one of the things that I enjoyed the most in reading it you know, there's the constant like knocking everyone unconscious is that um, like kind of reading the backstory of what was going on around the stuff. Like, uh, like when you read Upon a Star and you know that he um, was 
working, started doing that story when he was in Nazi occupied Belgium and he had to make an apolitical story that didn't offend anyone to be able to continue making comics. It adds such a, a different weight to things. Yeah, it has that European, it has that thing that's in a lot of European comics that maybe is too foreign to me where it's so entrenched in multiple political structure like a lot of european comics has that politics in it in a way that you don't get over here because even though we have political forces it's still all you know supposedly one country over there there's all these history they're so interested in history and political history and stuff and that shows up in a lot of their work and my brain's just never been able to like latch on to all of those little details i've never been like a history guy and so i think there's a barrier to me with with like Tintin and a lot of the other European work because of that. Interesting. It'd be interesting to do an episode where we just, because uh, I, I made a list of my favorite Tintin books. It'd be fun to take one of the best ones and read through it and talk through what what you don't like and what I do like about it. Yeah, for sure. That that will we'll do that absolutely. Um, we can get hopefully Sean can get in on that one too. We can all read Tintin. I don't remember what my favorite ones were. I remember really liking um, the one I mentioned, uh, the Falling Star, and uh, and I have the tattoo I have on one of my arms is from uh, Cigar of the Pharaohs, That's like which I like less. Of the run. Let me go. Yeah. Through. Oh sure. I got. It's a weird. I wish I would have got them in the soft cover because it's a hard cover, but they're really small. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine like his art and then his lettering like reading it that small oh yeah very, it looks like very, they broke up the deep. pages too oh did they yeah what story is that i can grab it off my shelf too it's tintin in america one second curious because like the pages are always cut in half no not always okay, try to take a minute yeah so tension in america I've got the okay, what is what does page one look like Here's page one. Yeah, that's that's right. Oh, it's just bigger panels than I thought. Well, it's, it's also just, it's it looks weird. So small. It's just so small. Yeah. And his it's it's kind of becomes like reading a Chris Ware book where you have to like <laughs> get into <laughs> it like this because, and then I really don't like um, I really don't like the lettering. And the word balloons i really don't like squared word balloons and i really don't like lettering that has lowercase interesting and capitals it makes it very it, it, it makes it much harder for me to read there's a, a thing i enjoy about the way the word balloons are they they're almost like um they come out like how i would write a, a radio voice you know these these kind of jagged balloons coming out yeah, and they're like big squares instead of balloons, and they're almost like they're almost they're almost always their own panel up top. So it's kind of like the old Prince Valiant, where it's like here's the picture and then here's the description, but instead really? of a description, it's the there's something about that, and that's pretty standard in European comics, and that's always been something about that is a barrier for me. I've never been able to. It just looks like stiff, like Mad Magazine too. I've never enjoyed Mad Magazine because of the lettering. It's always in these square word balloons and it always looks typeset. Interesting. Uh, yeah, because I, I think I have, I think it might be tied to nostalgia for me, but I, I immediately I'm going through this being like, why don't I do that? It makes a little more space in a panel. I feel like I'm always fighting for millimeters, you know? I feel like it's less space in a panel. It's like you're just cutting off the whole top of the panel or like he's not thinking about space. 
like he's just not willing to make the characters a little smaller so like like this indian's head like has to go into the panel like i get oh, it makes door. like on on uh on this one it sets up some depth but on uh this one it's just like just make the head a little bit smaller or something <laughs> i don't know when i was looking at this last night i was trying to read it last night I really felt like the word to picture ratio was wrong off. It's a pretty insane panel I'm looking at with Al Capone talking here. And it's just him sitting in front of a wall of text. Yeah, there's a lot of that where it's like, oh, Jesus. And then look at the very last last page. Look at this dude. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I remember thinking that was a little nuts. Um, and and that it's... might just be a thing of older comics, too. Like, I feel like older comics... They, they talked more. Yeah, they just hadn't figured out the ratio yet. And and then the having it not all caps to me makes it feel more, it, it makes it feel like a textbook instead of a conversation. Okay, like it's too kind of formal writing. Because I use lowercase sometimes when I'm lettering things when somebody is speaking kind of under their breath a little bit more. Well, that makes sense. But it, yeah, it's it looks too much like prose instead of dialogue in my mind but it's funny because you're talking about nostalgia these are probably the first comics i ever read was picking up tintin at the library because i always i always wanted the books where the words were tied to the pictures and not the here's the picture here's the description and so i'd purposely go look for books that had kids books that had word balloons and then i found the comic section and i know all they had was like garfield and tintin and so I know Tintin was like the first thing I ever read and I loved him as a kid, but I have no, like I'm looking at these and I have no memory of the stories or. Oh, it's, yeah. Cause I, I, I didn't even know if I'd read them all when I started doing my, my read through last year. Um, have you read much Asterix? I think that one is a little less dry than Tintin in some ways. Yes. I've read a lot of, I've read a lot of, I was just looking at picking up. Um, they also had a smaller version like this in hardcover that I saw at Barnes and Noble but I didn't like the size of it. And if, if I would have paid attention to the size on these, I wouldn't have ordered these. I would have got them in like the soft cover, like big. Yeah, the bigger ones, I, I definitely prefer. I also, we were talking about games and comics before. I have a, I have a Tintin Games book here. Ah, okay. That's which, a good way to wrap back around. <laughs> yeah, Hergate didn't, it's not that he didn't do new stuff for it, but they have all this stuff where they're, they're making kind of puzzles out of old uh, Tintin strips. Oh, to like put them in order? Yeah, one of the things, I'm not sure what the game on that one, one of the things that I really uh, liked is there's this page that just has these red squares in it, and I was thinking that could be a cool narrative device outside of using a game. What's the game there? It's Tintin must catch Snowy, and so you, one player's Tintin, the other one is Snowy. Tintin places his counter in the first picture, and he plays first at each turn. He moves two squares horizontally or vertically, or one square in each direction, and Snowy must run away from Tintin. And he plays his counter on the last pitcher and, and moves a square each turn. Um, yeah, so I guess they're they're each allowed to move. Tintin's allowed to move two, and Snowy's allowed to move one, and they they have to the Tintin has to catch Snowy while Snowy avoids him. And the That'd red panels are just, just like star. gaps or something. Yeah, yeah, maybe it was too much. It'd be interesting if that was just done as scenery or something. Like, here's a place you could run to. And doesn't Is that, matter which character. So that's a story that they made specifically, and the story has a game structure? No, I think it's just taken from a story, and then they turned it into a game by kind of collaging it. There's a uh, There are 32 mistakes in this drawing, one, two. Oh. Which is just... It'd be oh. interesting to put out a comic with no mistakes that you planned. Just be like, there's 32 mistakes in this comic. Find them. And, then and let me right, know when you right found in. them for the reprint. Yeah, right in. Whoever finds them all gets a prize. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I wonder I, what the mistakes are. I, I, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that that's collected in these. This is supposed to be like the complete in eight volumes or something. I don't think this has any. I don't think Hergate had anything to do with this, as far as I know. Oh, that's too bad. That looks pretty interesting. There's there's an old uh, gimmick that. Sergio Aragonas did where he would 
draw like a page that's all square panels and then mix the panels up and then oh, it was cool. up it was up to the viewer to solve the order of them I like um, that. and i really like that like when i do workshops on comics for my students i'll print that out and cut it up and then like because it's a storytelling activity right you have to you have to follow what it is that you know make those storytelling decisions with these pre-planned panels Right. I imagine some stories you could make different stories by different combinations of the panel. It reminds me of, I think Burroughs did that with like the, the beats with, with writing. They would take make books where they just cut up a bunch of uh, sentences and then have different ways to arrange them randomly. <laughs> yeah, with Aragonis ones, there's like an obvious answer. He's really good yeah. about that. But I do he think did less, he did less heroin too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that helps. Supposedly. <laughs> yeah allegedly he did less heroin allegedly he did less hair um yeah i think there's a space for that in comics uh these these like rearrangeable or you think about those those uh have you ever played that game where you have tiles and you can there's one tile missing and you can move the tiles around oh yeah that would a be comic version of that have you ever yeah. read there remember the pander brothers years ago did a comic book with um, they had symbols for every issue number and and you could read them in different order. It'd be interesting to do a comic where the story changes depending on which order you read or your perception. Like like maybe the, if you read one issue, it's it's the character who's the villain in the other issue. And so you're, who you're rooting for changes on which issue you start with. Oh, man, that would be a crazy structure. And you We're sell gonna... their motivations. After people watch this episode, there's going to be like 20 different comic projects <laughs> I mean, that's always that's always the goal because I really like talking about formalism, but there's always sometimes it's something that's so specific to a type of story. It's nothing that you can ever fit into your own schedule, you know. Well, and also I just had this sick realization uh, after we did the Sam Keith. For some reason, I was like, I got to do a whole book of like this kind of crazy textured, and it's like, fuck, man, I don't. I realized I'm at the age now where I have more ideas than I have time in my life to finish them. Yeah, who is it? Well, I think the artist Seth at one point, he actually calculated how many books he'd probably be able to do in his lifetime before he died. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and given that I work, you know, full time plus, like, I, it's just, I realized that, yeah, I have more ideas at this, but this is the first time I ever realized this or felt this in my life. And that was like, this kind of, weird yeah and there's always a weird thing I, I think too much about the idea of like um like sometimes when you're following art as it comes out like uh you know like when frank miller was doing sin city i'd assumed that he was just gonna keep doing it there's a point when he was doing i think helen back was the last sin city issue and i had a theory for a while where i was like i really like every other sin city and the you know the other ones are just not my favorite and that one was a confusing one where i was like i don't know if this one's good or good or not good but i'm going to be able to tell by the next one and he hasn't put out one since i didn't realize that i was at the end of it and there's something there's something like that sometimes where when you're in the middle of seeing an artist put out you don't know how close to the end of it is and maybe that's with our own work the same thing like we have no idea if we each have 50 more years of drawing comics or another two you know yeah but i i don't know about you but i have enough ideas to keep me busy for the rest of my life today i could tell you those ideas of things i want to try yeah and when you make stuff you're going to get more ideas and it's the first i've I, up until recently i've always said okay i'm getting to this point and then i'll be able to quit like i'll have mm -hmm. said everything i wanted to say and it looked achievable in my lifetime and then, yeah, it was a really like midlife crisis moment of like, oh shit, you got to pick and choose or just looking at manga and thinking, wow, I want to try this really decompressed storytelling. Wow, well, time for that. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is a lot to wrap your head around. Yeah, because I, I have an idea also that ideas that I have for stories kind of, they go bad if I don't use them soon. Because I've had things where I'm like, I've been like, oh, I want to do a story that that uses this this narrative trick, and I'm, I'm like, that that thing is going to make the story. And then I've gone and made the story, and I'm like, ah, that trick wasn't enough. I lost my enthusiasm about it. So I almost feel like I 
like when I get a, a, a new idea for a project, I have to either jump on it soon or just kind of let it let it go and, and I won't be able to get it to it sometimes. Or like the thematic relevance to your life diminishes? Yeah, because on, on some level, I mean, certainly with my work, a lot of what I'm doing is like thinly veiled autobiographical science fiction comics, you know? Yeah, or for me, it's like something I'm trying to sort through in my life. And the mm -hmm. idea of the story is kind of where I'm starting to get my answer. And then I really care about that answer for a while. But like, there's one I really want to do that's probably never going to happen about a, a guy who misses his chance to win the lottery. Mm -hmm. And I got started on taking all the photo reference and everything. And then when I moved to Alabama, like, I just don't have those models anymore. I don't have access to them. That's frustrating. And, and now it's been a couple years and we've, I've gone through so much in my life. I don't know that what I was trying to say is as important anymore, but like you still, it's so hard to let go of something that you cared so much about. And it's in your head is like, man, this is going to be this beautiful, awesome thing. That's going to rock people's worlds. And uh, it's really hard to let all those things go. Yeah, yeah, that is true. But yeah, your priorities change so much. I had a story um, I was doing, I was calling it Footprints on the uh, Footprints on Another World. And it was a guy who's, he was a prince and he was the footprints. It's a stupid pun. But um, uh, it was this story that I had this, I had this idea of like they find the planet that God lives on and they send a team of scientists to go meet God and they reach them and God doesn't speak English is the kind of gist of it. And I, I did a couple pages of it and it's the only comic I've ever abandoned. Like I, I told people the story so many times that I felt like I was like, I already, I already talked this story through so much that, that it just feels like I'm retreading old ground now. Yeah. Hey, Brandon, I got to go. My, my partner came home and she's, she's yelling at me through the door. Like something's gone <laughs> wrong with the dogs. Oh, well, um, good luck with the dogs. Yeah. All right. Thanks guys. Thanks for following along later.